We're only mouth. Who sings the distant heart that dwells whole at the core of all things? Its great pulse is parceled out among us into tiny beatings. And its great pain is like its great jubilation, too much for us. So again and again, we tear ourselves loose and our only mouth. But all at once, the great heartbeat secretly breaks in on us so that we scream. And then our being, transformation, visage. Hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're going to be exploring an organ that is of paramount importance to us all. I speak, of course, of the heart, that untiring pump which lies at the nexus of our physical and emotional well-being. While few could dispute its anatomical significance as a miraculous engine, a marvel of design unsurpassed by any human-made creation with its resilience and precision. Beating 100,000 time, 100, times a day, it clocks up 3 billion beats if you live to be 100. But although it's got remarkable pumping function, and that's undeniable, its other attributes are not quite so well understood. It is known to be super sensitive, not just in responding to emotions, but also in creating them. And you can indeed die of a broken heart. Recent findings have revealed a much deeper connection between the heart and the brain than was previously realized. To help us unlock some of these mysteries, we have with us today two great guests, a world expert in cardiac science, who is professor of cardiac pharmacology at Imperial College London. Sean Harding is author of a new book, the Exquisite Machine, The New Science of the Heart. Welcome, Sean. Hi, thank you. In addition, we'll be joined by physician and poet, Dr. Fadi Judah, who practices internal medicine at St. Luke's Baylor Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Judah will help us to talk about the collective heart, and he will tell us why his poetry informs his work as a doctor. So welcome to you, Fadi. Thank you. So let's start first with you, Sean. Uh, congratulations on your book, which I guess is in large part a product of 40 years working in the field, uh, particularly on the function of cardiomyocytes. Perhaps you could explain a little bit about those to us. Um, apparently we have two or three billion in one heart. Yes, but yes, absolutely. Um, but as we have five and, and we lose about two if we have a heart attack. They're, they're basically the, the little muscle cells. So if you've ever hold, held a heart, it's really solid thing. And uh, it's packed with muscle. It just has this giant muscle to push all the blood around your body. And, and it's really made up of these cells, which are like a jigsaw. They're, they're, they're connected to each other all over by electrical connections. So the electrical impulse can run through and the mechanical impulse can, can be coordinated. Uh, but if you if you take them out, uh, so we work out a way to kind of put some enzymes through and get the, all the little cells out, you can get one tiny cell, that's, that's sort of the, the width of a human hair. It will beat away in a dish like a little heart. It sort of looks like a, a crystal, actually. It, it's it's uh, like a, or a brick. It's got stripes on it, the, the stripes of the muscle fibers. And it'll just, you put the electrodes across it, just beat away just very nicely for a couple of days like that. Uh, just amazing. And uh, it's this contraction and relaxation of each of those tiny cells that adds up to the force that pushes the blood out of your muscle. Pretty phenomenal stuff, isn't it? So why did you become so fascinated with this one single organ? Um, well, there's sort of, there's, a, there's an emotional thing and there's a, a scientific thing. So the scientific thing, I just actually, to be honest, I just love these cells really. But um, the, uh, the fact that 
uh, you start off, uh, you know, we, we were trying, we've been trying, we've been arguing for a, quite a lot of my career, there was arguments about whether there was any kind of self-repair in the heart. And you kept wondering, the there must be, it's crazy not to have something that repairs itself. But it was really very difficult to find, and it wasn't until, I can explain this later if you want, the bomb tests and the carbon-14 in the atmosphere that we managed to carbon date the heart. And, and we could find that there was just a little bit of turnover, perhaps 1% a year. But that means that half your heart, half the cells in your heart, will um, uh, be there from the time you're born to the time you're di you die. And so one, one of these little tiny cells has been going for 100 years or, or, or something like that, which is just incredible for a start. Uh, and, and then there was the emotional thing, which is my, my father-in-law had heart failure just at the time when I was trying to decide between disciplines. And, and you know, I had I had thought about neuro and, and mathematics, all sorts of things. But this kind of pushed me in the way of the cardiac side. Interesting. And you're still interested, obviously. So you've just written yeah. a book about it. I mean, you know, still, still, even now, I'm retired actually, but even now, every every month something new comes out that makes me go, wow, about the heart. That's wonderful. Um, so obviously over those 40 years, uh, technologies advanced remarkably. Um, it used to be you just have to open somebody up to see what was wrong. And now imaging makes that all possible without surgery. So what are the other sorts of things that are now at, dispose, at our disposal, like the stem cell technology, which is exciting in terms of repairing the heart? Uh, well, that has been very exciting. Um, uh, again, kind of in quite a visceral way. Um, the, the, the cardiac myocytes, as I talked about, uh, once they're out of the heart, they get they die of quite honestly loneliness. It's called the noikis. It's, it's actually means an, an homeless or, or, or um, uh, lonely. So that's a good word for you, Paddy, um, <laughs> <laughs> for, the, for the poem. And um, uh, so they, they then break down their structure and they, without the mechanical sort of uh, stimulus. Um, and uh, but we've been able to make uh, cardiac myocytes will last for a, a year, more than a year. So and out of skin or, or, or blood or something. So these are the, stem, the pluripotent stem cells. Uh, there's you might have heard of embryonic stem cells mm -hmm. that come from the venous system. And so they're fantastic. They, they're going to make all the cells of the body. And so if you get the right solutions, you get those, and you can grow them up in huge amounts. If you get the right solutions, you can push them to be a kidney or a liver or a heart. So you can do that. And, and they will, will, they will have, form these heart cells and they will form quite masses of heart cells quite spontaneously. But of course, there was a problem that you're destroying an embryo. You know, some of them were left over from IVF, but still... That was a big problem. So about 10, just over 10 years ago, somebody won the Nobel Prize for showing you can reprogram cells in ordinary cells in your body back to their sort of virgin state, back to factory settings, basically. So that they, um, by using some of the factors that have been known for the uh, embryonic stem cells. And so you can take a skin cell and you grow them up. Um, they grow quite well in a dish. Then if you treat them with these factors, they become, they kind of wipe their memory and they become stem cells. And so you can do exactly what you just did with the embryonic ones. And so you can make um, your skin cells now become your heart cells. And there's and some amazing things that that means. First, they'll immune match to you. If you have a heart transplant, you have to have to take immunosuppressive the whole time. And that's quite nasty drugs, I'm sure Paddy will agree with me. Um, uh, but for the embryonic, the pluripotent cell, the induced pluripotent stem cells, that's what they're called, the ones you make from your own skin, then you they will be immune matched to you. Um, and so if we were to, I mean, theoretically at least, if we were to put them back onto, onto your heart, they shouldn't be rejected. So there's sorry. that. Yeah. Sorry, are you still going? I just, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, just one more thing that I'm sorry, you have to, you'll have to just stop me, I'm afraid. But um, because if you had a, if you have a, a, something wrong with your heart, like um, a mutation that makes your heart rhythm problematic, it shows up in these cells. And so you can now test drugs on them with, so you can test something on your heart. External. 
a heart, yes. That's handy. Mm. That's handy. So how far are we off from uh, actually growing a heart? Um, so we've grown these patches of, of cells. And so that's in very small clinical trials, very small clinical trials at the moment, just reported from the Japanese ones that start in, in 2020 and they're safe. That's pretty much it at the moment. The, the, the problem with growing a whole heart from those is you need the blood vessels too. And so there's lots of work going on with 3D printing and, and things like that to try and uh, print those blood vessels into, into the heart. There's, there's more than just cut muscle in the heart. Big job, big job. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get there though, I'm sure we will. Um, okay, so because the heart is so strong and resilient, but it's also super sensitive, it makes it difficult to uh, repair, is that right? Uh, uh, yes, it's 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 just evolved so so well. Um, I mean, one of you know one of the things, for example, if you take these pluripotent stem cells and you inject them into the heart, um, because they're young cells and and they're not they're not quite the same as the older ones, and also at the beginning they're not attached to each other, they will disrupt the the all that beautiful jigsaw of the heart. If you put too many in, then then you'll start to get rhythm disturbances, and so uh, it'll it, after a couple of months that'll that'll die down as they do integrate. But you know, having really serious arrhythmias for two months is something you can't have in a therapy. And and in the same way, when we try to stimulate that very small amount of repair, it did work. It did prevent the heart attack scar, but if it keeps going, then because when they, when the heart when the cells have to divide, they have to break down their structure and then divide and then build it all up again. If too many of them are doing that at once, again, just disrupts the, the right. substrate right. of the heart. Right. So uh, um, so it's just it's just too perfect too perfectly made to to uh, for us to get our our technologies in. Our grimy hands upon. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, they do have amazing uh, things that we can do outside of the stem cell stuff. I mean, like the size of pacemakers has shrunk and these coils that monitor, um, that kind of tell you when things are going right. All that's re pretty recent, isn't it? In the last... That's right. So though, all that technology is getting better and better. So you can have a device that, a CRTD device, which paces the heart so if you've got a rhythm disturbance it's paced but then if you if you it senses a really bad one it'll shock you out of it like a defibrillator in your chest um, and then it'll coordinate the two sides of your heart better so the right and the left are, are you know behaving together and that'll improve the contraction so that's and, and it'll send back um, messages uh, so you have a box by your bed and so every every night it'll send back all everything that happened to your heart during the day to the pacing clinic, and then they can look at that and uh, just make sure you're all right and, and test it out and change your heart rate from from the, from you know their phones. It's Remote, oh, gosh. yeah, that's that's freaky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, Let's move to another area now, which is that we know all about the, the, uh, the you know, the logistical structure of the heart and, and what it's meant to do and the electrical rhythms and what have you. But it's, it's first of all, it's got anatomical stuff. You know, it's got the defects, the electrical malformations. Then it's subject to disease. Then it's also subject and vulnerable to all sorts of stress and emotional um, upheaval. I'm starting to feel really sorry for it. Um, <laughs> It's not doing well, isn't it? After all it's that, it's doing incredibly well. So, so most people know about stress causing heart attacks, but in your book, you reference um, about the broken heart syndrome, which um, you know now is not being treated as some sort of um, you know hysterical idea that somebody has, but is a real physiological complaint caused by an emotional distress. Well, um, sure. yeah. uh, I actually heard this physician today talking on this heart break um ted talk saying in the whole time he was at um studying cardiology they never once in all the years of study mentioned any emotional component with problems with the heart he couldn't believe it in that whole time so um 
let's let's have a talk about this mini brain that's that's in the heart and also about this broken heart syndrome i think a lot of people would be really interested about that so so the the heart is controlled by the, the, the generally speaking by the system that you don't have to take any notice of so the, the autonomic nervous system so you've got the sympathy it can be sped up by adrenaline the sympathetic one it can be slowed down again by the other one as, as you need to do it but also inside the heart there's a little plexus of, of nerves like a kind of mini brain as, as you said um, and that has got not only those nerves but sensory nerves and so it interacts with the central nervous system so you you the heart it can in a sense create emotion um so uh, there's a thing called interoception where you can you're sensitive to your body organ systems and some some people are more sensitive to others so some people can know their heart rate all the time most of us can can feel when our heart is pounding when it's really racing so you know you 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 can you can feel that um and uh, if you, uh, so in a sense, that can tell us that we're frightened. So if you react so quickly to, to um, the low conscious level to something frightening and, and you need to get very, very quickly. And so your autonomic nervous system is reacting extremely quickly. And then it's kind of telling you that you're, you're, you, should, you should run, you should, you know, your heart's racing. And so if you even play the sound of a racing heart to somebody and tell them it's their heart, then they, you can induce a panic attack in them. So, you know, you're, you're uh, you know, reacting. And there's very clever experiments where they show one thing that people respond to a lot is frightened faces, not frightening faces, frightened faces. Um, because that's the kind of contagion you would get in a crowd. You would see that somebody is, is, is frightened of something and it makes evolutionary sense that you pick that up really, really quickly. And so if you play that to somebody, flash that at them at the peak of their heartbeat, when your heart's beating, beating part hard, and, or when the heart's relaxed within the same beat, you get a much bigger fear response by you know, skin resistance and things at the top of the beat than you do at the bottom of the beat. So that's an amplification of, of the system. That's in, within one heartbeat. Good Lord. Somebody's just written a, a question for us here. Uh, obviously the brain needs the heart else it will expire due to oxygen deprivation, but does the heart need the brain or can it function adequately without as occurs under they put anesthesia? Yes, I, well, you, you can tell that. It, I mean, I've, I've gone into the operating theatre when they're taking the, uh, usually go to get to get the um, transplanted heart, the, the heart, the failing heart, and I take that away for study while they're putting a donor heart in. And mm -hmm. they, they sometimes just leave it on the side and you can see it eating away there quite happily. Wow. And then we can take it back and we, we actually put it on a rig um, with, with uh, liquid flowing through it um, and keep it going for some some hours they've got an organ they've got a, a something like that now to carry the hearts around in so they're being confused all the time and they will beat away and they'll sometimes recover a bit actually um if they uh if they're on that uh, while they're being transported so the broken heart mm -hmm. so so this is really an extreme thing about the emotion so i was talking about sort of a uh, lower level one but it's very true and broken heart because bereavement is is the key thing and there's various ones there was somebody quite recently in one of the shootings mm. died very recently very quickly after their their child had been killed um you're much more likely to die on the day after your spouse has died or same day than you are any other day that year and the risk sort of drops off with with uh, time uh, about, over about six months but the anniversary of your of the death um you you said uh, that that the the, TED talk, the the person was woman was looking at the photograph of her husband a, a couple of weeks later so very clear that arguments very strong as well um uh, football um there's a big spike in heart disease uh and and this kind of thing um uh, during uh, cup finals, about 30% increase on, on, on the cup final, particularly penalty shootouts. 
Um, that's a bit different for a UK sport from 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 American football, <laughs> but, but but it's but it's the same for all the sports. So um, and I've got a great thing there, and you put it there in the chat chat now about um, uh, the missed penalty kick uh, there. Um, uh, the having a, an effect on, on a, a husband and wife and so um the the uh the syndrome you were talking about that uh the the, the woman had gone into hospital thinking they had a heart attack and when they were imaged they, they weren't having a heart attack there was no blockage or anything but uh, just after a really stressful event um then the you could see if you echo if you imaged in in a, the right way that the heart was contracting in a very odd way. It was beating really hard at the top and then ballooning out at the mm. bottom. And that gives an acute heart failure. Um, but uh, and that's called Takatsubu because it was first seen in Japan and it looked like an octopus pot. That's right. Uh, so, so that's that's the weird name for that. Um, and the thing about this, there is a there is a mortality associated with it. It's about five percent. But about you know, the rest of the people will recover. There's not much to do, actually. Most of the things that doctors would do would make it worse. And so not doing things is the right thing for, for this one. And um, well, talk yeah, therapy, but, really, just acknowledging that they are yeah. having an emotional crisis rather than a heart attack, is, which but is they, what's they, going on. But they've got something wrong with the heart. There's, it's, it's not that they're imagining it. It's got something wrong with the heart. And then gradually it, it wears off after, after some days or, or weeks. And so that's been uh, uh, very interesting uh, for, for, for me. And one of the things being that it's 95, 90 to 80 to 90% postmenopausal women. But there's another uh, thing that's also called broken heart syndrome where um, people just get ventricular fibrillation, just their heart you know, goes into overload and they, they die instantly you know, in a few minutes, they collapse and that's it. They're not defibrillated. They can, if you're defibrillated, you're, you, can, you can be saved. But, but and that sudden cardiac death, and that's 80 to 90% male. Um, so, so that mostly men get that. So our hypothesis has been that that Takatsubu is kind of the least worst thing you can happen to you. You're kind of getting this, your heart's shutting down temporarily to stop these, these arrhythmias, to stop itself getting damaged more. And um, we, we, we did an experiment in the lab where we anesthetized some rats and, and we gave them a dose of, uh, it's adrenaline is the thing that does this. We gave them a dose from an EpiPen um, mm. or rat-sized EpiPen, really, not, not a whole EpiPen. Um, and they, they got the Takotsubi syndrome. And we, we had worked out what that mechanism was. And we tried to block it. And by blocking it, we flipped them into sudden cardiac death. Oh, dear. So, so they're still, still under, they just, they just died under the anaesthetic. Um, and, and so uh, we stopped doing that, actually. So obviously, that wasn't a good idea. Um, and uh, so I think it's that that you know you if you if you prevent them going into Takotsubu, then they will they will go into a sudden cardiac death syndrome. So really? it's a kind of a slightly protective thing. All right. Um, so I'm going to move to another area um, away from the um, anatomy for a moment, <coughs> the um, emotional aspect. Um, in your book. When I first approached you about doing the program, it was because of the book. <coughs> but at that time, I didn't realize that you had got a poem in that book by E. e. Cummings, a beautiful poem, I Carry Your Heart With Me. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to, have you got your voice back there? Yeah, yeah. Shall I, uh, shall I, would it be best for me to tell you why I, well, why? I would love to hear why you chose that. And then I'd like you to read it before we get to Fadi. <clears throat> oh, well. During the regenerative medicine thing, while we were trying to um, work out what, what was happening, people were looking at the stem cells that the stem cells are naturally in the body, and um, it, it, it what it, it seems that um, when you're having a baby, the baby's stem cells can cross the placental barrier and go in, go into the mother, 
and um, they can stay there for, for a long time. You, they've been found in, uh, say, when women are having um, hip operations, when they're much older, you know, decades after the pregnancy, they can find the baby stem cells. They find it because of the, uh, if it's a, a male baby, a boy, then you can see the, the uh, male gene in there. So it stands out from the mother, but it does happen for female, for, for girl babies too. Um, and so you can find these decades later. And um, uh, the, the so, so they what they did with certain, again with some mice is they um, uh, crossed them uh, with other mice. So the babies had a bioluminescent protein in them. And that means you can put a probe over the, the mother mouse and you can see the babies inside uh, because they, they, you can see the bioluminescence. And you can also see um, the stem cells moving away from the from the baby mice into into the mother. And if you make a tiny nick in the ear of the mother, the stem cells rush to that, and it looks like they're trying to repair it. Um, and in, in women, uh, this uh, who've had breast cancer surgery, they found the baby stem cells in their. Um, in, in the wound for, 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 for the uh, you know, surgical wound, the breast cancer. So we don't know, but that's, the, that's the, the idea that they're certainly there. Maybe they've got some kind of regenerative function. Um, just don't know. Um, but what it means is that you have your, and I like this, your, the women are, who have had babies are chimeras. They, they have, they've got a mixture of people cells. So they're not just one person. And they have their, their children's cells in there. And also, of course, they will have the DNA for the father because each cell will have the you know mother's and father's DNA. So you can't get rid of your husband, you know, even if you wanted to, it's, it's still there. So in a very real sense, this poem is literally true. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. So have you got a copy that you could read? Yes, so I should read it for you now. <clears throat> I carry your heart with me, I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear, and whatever is done by me is only your doing, my darling. I fear no fate, for you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world, for beautiful, you are my world, my true. And it's you are whatever a moon has always meant, and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret that nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than a soul can hope or a mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. That's beautiful. That's really lovely. So this is a, a very nice bridge to our second guest, um, Fadi Judah, who is a physician and a poet. And I believe you began writing poems, Fadi, when you were working um, for Doctors Without Borders in Africa. Um, and in, since then, which is some years, you've written several books. You're now published, just published your fifth collection, Tethered to Stars. Um, and despite being a devoted doctor, you say that writing is my original heart. So I'd like you to explain a little bit about how you became a poet, what triggered that initial impulse to write uh, and what sustains it? Um, and then I'll get you to read some of your poems if you don't mind. You're mute. Great. I, thank you. I think that we are, um, uh, as far as poetry is, is concerned or art or the original heart, uh, one is born with that. And whether one uh, recognizes it um, or not is a different story. But um, I, I feel like I lived a life that made me into a physician, but I was born uh, a poet. I mean, not be a good poet, but I was born a poet. Um, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Harding said about the regenerative power of the heart, um, the idea that 50% of your original heart cells remain with you when you die. 
uh, at least. Uh, it's also an echo of what she said about the stem cells or the baby uh, cells, uh, the fetal cells uh, circulating in the mother, which is, and then translating it into the language of, I carry your heart with me. And I feel like uh, I was lucky to uh, recognize an, an, an original or an essence of my heart early on as a poet and stick to that. Um, because I think that we uh, often um, struggle through our lives to, to find out a lot about our original hearts um, that stay with us. And uh, we spend all our lives trying to figure out who, who is it that we were born, not to be, but as. Um, uh, and I am not against change and mutability and et cetera, but what's, I, I think it's a, it's a sort of an existential angst perhaps for all of us to return to our original heart. Um, um, and I think that in, in the language of mystics of any um, uh, culture or religion, uh, the, the, the isness of the heart or the essence of the heart uh, gives itself over to the mind as consciousness grows, as we forge ahead into the world. Um, but then if one is lucky, uh, or if one has trained the heart, the mind, uh, the mind returns and submits to the original heart yet again. Um, and if one is lucky to have lived, um, I mean, you know, you need a little bit of luck of that for that uh, to, you know, to, to get to enjoy your original heart um, before before too late. Um, uh, then I, I that's how I hear also the scientific language that we um, uh, speak of uh, um, at a cellular level. Uh, the, the other term, for example, that Professor Harding used was interoception. And so it is this. Um, there's this uh, uh, old uh, uh, Sufi uh, love uh, verse. It's difficult to translate uh, uh, nicely, but um, um, but it says, speaking of um, uh, you know, it says we all know you feel it in your gut, your butterflies, etc. Um, it says uh, my love um, lives in my gut. But if he chooses, he can walk upon my cheeks. And that awkward expression is to say that this is the expression of the manifestation uh, between the heart and the gut by blushing. Mm. So blushing becomes a manifestation of many emotions. One of them is love when you hold your beloved in your viscera. Um, so I do think that a lot of the human language, uh, old or new uh, or recent, such as E.E. E. Cummings, has been quite in touch with, um, uh, with, with the sort of us being on this earth um, and, and having this amazing memory about what it was for us to encounter consciousness for the first time from millennia ago. And miraculously we've passed it on through language um, and science is here to reproduce it and um, and take it elsewhere. Wow. Well, I like the new book, Tethered to Stars, because it kind of strings all those kind of ideas together, doesn't it? You've got, you know, uh, the physicality of it, you've got kind of metaphor, um, in fact, you do that quite a lot in your poems. You go from a very biological language to something that's symbolic. Um, it's easier for you to do it than for me to talk about it. So maybe um, I should have you read one of your um, poems, um, Progress Notes, I think, that kind of demonstrates that quite well. Sure. <clears throat> uh Progress Notes. The age of portrait is drugged. 
Beauty is symmetry so rare, it's a mystery. My left eye is smaller than my right. My big mouth shows my nice teeth perfectly aligned like Muslims in prayer. My lips an accordion. Each sneeze a facial thumbprint. One corner of my mouth hangs downward when I want to hold my gaffa, when I want to hold a gaffa hostage. Bell's palsy, perhaps, or what Mark Twain said about steamboat piloting, that a doctor's unable to look upon the blush in a young beauty's face without thinking it could be a fever, a malar rash, a butterfly announcing a wolf. Can I lie face down now as cadavers posed on first anatomy lesson? I didn't know mine was a woman until three weeks later we turned her over. Out of reverence, there was to be no untimely exposure of donors, our patrons of our patrons who were covered in patches of scrubs green dish towels. And by semester's end, we were sick of all that, tossed mega livers and mammoth hearts into lab air and caught them. My body was Margaret. That's what the death certificate said when it was released before finals. The cause of her death, nothing memorable, frail old age. But the colonel in table 19 with an accessory spleen had put a bullet through his temple a final prayer, not an entry or exit, were there skull cracks to condemn the house of death, no shattered glass in the brain, only a smooth tunnel of deep violet that bloomed in concentric circles. The weekends were lonely. He had the most beautiful muscles of all 32 bodies that were neatly arranged, zipped up as if a mass grave had been disinterred, or when unzipped and facing the ceiling had cloth over their eyes as if they'd just been executed. Gray silver hair, chiseled countenance. He was 67, a veteran of more than one war. I had come across that which will end me, extend me at least once without knowing it. Wow. Well, I love the way you kind of grapple with the metaphysical questions all the time. And I wonder if, um, well, obviously you can't know how many other doctors do that kind of uh, internal dialogue with themselves. Um, I wondered how much you thought some of what, how you write and how you think is influenced by your cultural upbringing and being exposed to all sorts of things like Rumi uh, in a way that we're not generally here in the West. I have, uh, I think uh, the, the only uh, main way I would say that this applies is through my own particular merger of cadence between two languages. But I am a person who believes that uh, no language and no alphabet is more or less capable than another of speaking about love or metaphysics or you know, mystery or violence or or science or anything like that. So, um, uh, you know, so I, um, um, I, I, I guess that's the the genuine, honest answer. And instead of you know feeling that there's always a way to um, um, want to specify um, a difference. Uh, because the differences are there for sure, but you know the similarities of human language, I think, in the brain are uh, much more overwhelmingly common than we'd like to accept. Um, and because I think language in the brain is universal, which which is part of that original heart answer that I gave about poetry, because poetry for me is. Um, the music of the mind, language as music in the mind. 
And uh, when I was young, I, I was quite, I, I noticed that there was uh, some uh, uh, pull or draw or, you know, um, uh, I was compelled to, to, to sing language and I could never shake that off. Um, yeah, but you, you've referenced another poem you said to me was one of your favorites, um, which is not written by you, but by Rilke. Um, and I also wondered if you wouldn't mind reading that, because again, it, it speaks to this kind of collective heart. Yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, healthy that my favorite poems are not mine. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, yes, it's a poem by uh, Rainer Maria uh, Relke, a German poet, and uh, here it goes, it's a short one. We're only mouth. Who sings the distant heart that dwells whole at the core of all things? Its great pulse is parceled out among us into tiny beatings. And its great pain is like its great jubilation too much for us. So again and again, we tear ourselves loose and our only mouth. But all at once, the great heartbeat secretly breaks in on us so that we scream. And then our being, transformation, visage. So when you speak about the collective heartbeat, um, the great heartbeat. Do you see this as the voice of humanity or do you see some kind of continuity of life where we might have many more lives? Because you said at one point to me, you can only have one heart at a time. Right. I, I, uh, there is a... a, a uh... The uncertainty thing, the uncertainty. Yeah, there is a, a no, there is a saying by the Prophet Muhammad, a, a, a true, a true believer cannot possess two hearts in one chest. And the uncertainty principle in, in quantum physics says you, and I'm poetically paraphrasing it here, you cannot know the characteristics of two particles at the same time. You can only know one with exact certitude, but not the other. You know a little bit about the other, but not as much as you know about one. You cannot know both together at the same time. And so I kind of feel like, oh, well, this is what this, these are all the, the, the way that um, we can only sit with one heart at a time inside us. It's not that, you, that, that I am not made of several hearts, metaphorically speaking, but I can only know uh, only one of them at a time. Or can, I can only sit with one of them at a time. Now, of course, we live in an age where we bring up the word mindfulness and 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 uh, singular focus and what have you. But it feels to me that it's a meditative, a calling, you know, for for contemplation, um, where where one can sit uh, with one heart within one chest uh, uh, at a at a, any given moment to know it truly. Um, and of course, we live in a cultural moment where, where we are scattered like, uh, um, you know, indescribably. So I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> well, it brought up another one, which um, I'm going to give this to both of you because it's something that interests me um, and it's whimsical, really because, you know, some people will poo this and other people will say, oh, no, no, there's, there's something interesting here. So I've read on more than one occasion of accounts of individuals who have received heart transplants and then start to assume characteristics or behavior of the donor that gave them the heart. I mean, quite remarkably different behavior. Can you in any way account for this scientifically, um, you know, like muscle memory or something? Maybe Sean will say there's muscle memory in the heart tissue. I don't know. Or do you have anything to say about it? So I'm going to ask each of you to uh, speak about that. Um, I mean, I, I, I 
I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, I have to say. Uh, I mean, having said that, I've just said that people are chimeras and, and you know, so that we get cells from each other. So, you know, there is that. Um, but of course, having a heart transplant will make you feel so much better, so much quicker that that you might feel like a feel like a different person. Uh, so, you know, I'm I'm just uh, I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to pull on the science line here. Um, and, and there are I have to say there is one operation where you can have two hearts um, uh, where you have a heterotopic transplant. And so sometimes in the first days of transplantation, the hearts weren't. Uh, big enough or strong enough and so instead of putting replacing the donor heart for the failing they would put the donor heart uh, in uh, in series with the failing and so it would be plumbed into the um the uh, abdomen and on the aorta there to 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 uh, wow. yes and so the 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 favorite trick was to get a medical student and and try to get them to understand why there were two pulses there you know the doctor who operation basically um uh so um but but from a from a scientific point of view i would have said probably and we have done a lot of transplants now probably probably i don't believe it what about you fadi yeah i i am also uh skeptical because i think there are too many variables um and that the that the the violence of the immunosuppressive medications is is a thing of its own. What it changes in the body, the the as Professor Harding said, the the uh, um, the fact that your health is better, um, um, sort of the 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 elation or spirituality of of survival. Um, it, these are you know uh, quite different things, and I don't know that we. You know, we, um, until I suppose, and this is again the the doctor heart, the doctor mind thinking. Until we are able to study the patterns of the donor heart, you know, when you don't really know who's going to be the donor heart, and see well some of those characteristics um, exist in the in the in the recipient. But there are just too many variables. Um, however, I, I would like to say that there is this, I, I mentioned it, and I'm sorry I don't have a, a link for it or did not offer it. There is a, a famous um, uh, French philosopher by the name of Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, who um, has a lovely book called Corpus, uh, and the last chapter in it is called The Intruder, um, and he is a heart transplant recipient, and he talks in it beautifully, not necessarily about his changes, um, but what it means, what what happens to uh, the indoctrinated being of of being in one's body at one point, then suddenly you have an intruder within you. Mm. Uh, and so it is not necessarily down to that particular heart or the donor. Um, um, you know, but but it, it is an essay worth reading, The Intruder by Jean-Luc Nancy. Mm. We'll put that in. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> you refer uh, more than once to the lack of words that, that exists um, for feelings or situations as a doctor. Um, and there's one that I would like you to read. Um, it's The Mother Between Us. And the opening of that is, how does the soul look upon the body? And in this poem, you seem to sum up in some ways the inadequacy of medicine. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind reading from the hope is a mother section, please. Sure. Um, yeah. So I, it's a, a longish poem. I'll read from the part you requested. Um, hope is a mother. I have a mother too, but I am not the history of those who betrayed you. When I say that plasma and antibiotics can no longer show anyone what healing is, what healing is an answer that you're a stranger to. Yet this I concede, your sorrow is greater than mine your grief to come. Between us is your mother and what she was 
the twine to commence their meeting. You have a day job, can't visit her during my working hours, and I'm the unknown caller you've come to know well. Or the quarantine made us smartphone pals. The summoning of the soul to exit a body, to enter a body in an afterlife or none. The inevitable that never ceases to astonish. That's powerful stuff. So um, in some ways, do you have to keep that sense of astonishment and wonder? Um, not just to be a good poet, but uh, to be a good doctor? Yes, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it's a struggle to keep it in a sort of a very administered bureaucratic existence, even, you know, for clinical medicine. Um, but, but it is a struggle because uh, you remember in our chat earlier, I'd, I'd heard something I'm quoting on some radio station. Somebody was saying that, um, uh, you know, the, the, in the, since the Victorian age, we've, we've, uh, we've suppressed sex, we've suppressed nature, and we've suppressed death. Um, and, uh, and I think in the aspect of, you know, on, on the death aspect, we, we don't really have these conversations. I mean, there is this kind of, you know, um, if, if life does not triumph over death as in, in the, you know, that this is sort of a, one of the messages and problematic messages of, um, the modern, you know, the, the modern age we live in about medicine and the biopolitics, um, uh, the power of life over death is, is sort of some of the complexity that we live in. And you can't talk, we can't, we can't as a society uh, find compassion and humility in dying. We only find defeat and suffering. And uh, it's overwhelming when uh, uh, you see it. Um, uh, maybe in a personal level with my uh, fellow citizens or, or uh, you know, city mates or, uh, but it's also more complex and painful. And uh, when, when you see it uh, uh, in, in, in many places in the country, but also across the world where people uh, don't even have access to basic care. Um, for example, you know, just to, to be um, uh, provocative, uh, maybe not so provocative, uh, um, we spend so much on transplant medicine, uh, but politics prevent us from providing basic antibiotics to children all over the world dying from absolutely preventable uh, uh, deaths. Uh, so, so we're missing something in the way that we can face up to our relationship to dying. It's not about giving up, it's actually about a greater compassion. And uh, I don't wanna sound like I'm, you know, the best doctor that anyone can, you know, <laughs> can, can encounter, but, but yeah, but it's just worth saying these things, I think. Um, so one of your newer poems that you sent me, um, there is no word for you in my other language, which I think is, speaks to what I'm, I'm saying. So here you're referring to sort of the limits of linguistic translation, of transferring a meaning from one language to another, but you're also speaking, I think, to the fact that the language of love is actually wordless. Correct, yes. Uh, mm. And uh, yes. I'll just read the poem. Um, there is no word for you in my other language. Seasons are four, and four the rooms in the heart. I will not stay long, or maybe I shouldn't rush. The heart has vaults and secret corridors. They may keep me a while. Clarity contains the unknown heart in which I am a passing blood. The heart with its windows and doors, pegs and cords, 
that no pumping topples is not the one I seek, and also not the blown part. I seek the quiet dark of it, the guide that leads my listening to a hidden pulse I shouldn't rush. Blood longs to begin again in passion with falling in the dark. Have you heard it murmur in the rooms of the heart? What did it say as it pooled on the run? My heart plays at giving with hearts that play at taking in the dark rooms of the heart. I love that. I love the, la you know, the rooms, the chambers, uh, the occupancy. It's, it's very cool. So um, I think this is, this is um, I asked you this before and you hesitated about whether being a poet makes you a better doctor. And you kind of laughed dryly at the, the thought. Um, but what I meant by that was, does it make you perhaps more empathetic or more conscious of things like silence um, and the importance of silence? This doctor today and this heartache TED talk said he realized that he talked too much that he gave the average patient 16 seconds when they came in the room before he started talking so he never actually listened to them um, and he said that he's gotten much better so I, I just bring this up because you know the spaces in your togetherness idea um, do, you, do you think perhaps you you are a more compassionate doctor because you write, you think about those things. Um, it, I mean, the, the reason I, you know, privately laughed, Riley, as you say, is because if I am better, then it is because, um, not because of the poetry per se, but because of age, uh, at least for me, uh, and time and, and other external factors. And because there are many uh, wonderful kind patient uh, and clinically superb physicians, colleagues who are not poets. Um, and, uh, and, and they're not anything else other than, you know, they're primarily in a, in a sort of a professional or artisan way, uh, any, anything else but physicians. So I, I don't want to, um, in my case, attribute uh, uh, you know, the, the arrow doesn't go for me from poetry into medicine, but the other way. Um, I think that um, people's stories, uh, listening to them uh, or encountering that intensity of hope and despair um, says a lot and teaches me a lot as far as being a poet, being a listener. Uh, and I use it in my poems. Um, uh, and I think whether I use it in my poems or not, I would learn to be better the next time with other patients. But being a writer, you're somewhat of a, a hunter, opportunist. You're listening to the world. There is a selfishness in, in this kind of joy for, oh, what a story to tell or what a feeling to, to recapture. Um, and sometimes it's, it's my own poetry is my own survival from medicine, mini survival, because the intensity of encountering the poem about the mother between us, I, I had to come home and, and write it after that week ended, uh, my, my seven days on in the hospital ended, um, because I, you know, there are just days or hours when I really am overwhelmed by coming so close to that responsibility of encountering a human being's, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, at, at the ending of a life in a, in a body and a consciousness and all that surrounds it, uh, you know, the family and, and, and so forth. And it's just, sometimes it's difficult to bear. So I have to come back. So I, I, you know, I think maybe Medicine really influences my poetry and, and it sort of uh, sometimes uh, saves me from myself a little bit. Well, it's our benefit, I have to say, that, that you um, <clears throat> combine the two.
so well. Although you did say, which surprised me, that if you had to choose between medicine and, and writing, that you would choose writing. So the reason why, because this culture tends to devalue the humanities and the importance of, of something like poetry. It just is, oh, are you doing accounting? Are you doing computing? Are you going to be a lawyer or a doctor? Um, everything else is kind of like, ah, it's nice, but you don't need, it's not essential. So for you to actually think that, that, that this might be a higher calling or an equal calling to being a physician, I find that quite refreshing. I, I'm not, I didn't say that to spite culture. I, I think for me, no. it goes back to um, the original heart. I've, I've been a, 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 you know, I graduated from medical school in, in 1996. I, you know, it's two decades and counting of me being a, a physician in one capacity or another or another and uh, done Doctors Without Borders and done clinics, hospital works, emergency room work. And uh, I, I feel like, well, you know, um, uh, I, I live in a structured system where, frankly, I am, uh, am not essential uh, as a physician. There's, you know, I come, I go, I've already done sort of my societal service. I've learned so much of, uh, you know, so it feels to me that I'm just ready to return to my original heart and see where a fuller life in writing would take me. You know, that, that's, that's primarily the reason. There's less violence in writing, I think, than in encountering the difficulties of administered modern medicine uh, in a corporate capital structure. Wow. There's a quote. <laughs> it's probably true, though. I, I can only imagine. Well, uh, maybe you'll do what Dr. Uh, Professor Harding's just done and um, write the book. Well, you... um, I have to say that uh, one of the things about writing the book is to, in, for, for everybody, is to try and write something that people might actually want to read rather than the, the kind of things we have to write for science, which is more like writing equations, honestly, and to have some adjectives in there even. And maybe that'll be a bridge to something even a bit, I don't know, that I, my, my emotions have now been too, too tamped down by years of science, but to, to try and find my way back to the heart, yeah. That's beautiful, that's nice. Well, it was a very readable book, I applaud. Very okay. easy to read, you don't have to struggle with it. So, well, I, I can't believe it, but the hour has flown by. Um, uh, it's been a very interesting discussion from, you know, we've covered a lot of possibilities there and, and raised a lot of interesting questions, I think, uh, about what we're about in medicine and where we're going and where we're going as people, which um, always good to take stock of, I think. Um, so I'm actually going to thank both of the wonderful guests we had. Professor Sean Harding from Imperial College, Dr. Fada Judith, who joined us from Texas, Houston, Texas. Uh, you took time out of your busy lives in separate time zones uh, to share your insights and poetry today. Uh, Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council, Cambridge Community Foundation, and you. So if you'd like to donate or sign up to the members list, go to the website, which is www.cambridgeforum.org. Um, there you'll find lots of podcasts of past programs and other video links to forums that we've done. And we have a large digital collection of classic recordings there. We produce this program for NPR broadcast and also a video of today's program will be uploaded shortly to YouTube, courtesy of GBH4 Network, who partnered with us. Next forum, The Art of Resistance, will take place on Tuesday, October the 4th. It will look at the work of South African artist Peter Sachs, whose latest exhibition of 88 portraits features people who, who embody the idea of resistance. You can sign up for that now on the website. So I'd like to thank everybody who joined us from all over the country. Thank both of you and say I hope to see everybody again soon. Bye-bye.